So the first thing you want to see about me is that I'm doing my presentations without shoes. It's uh, a tradition that started a few years ago. Um, is David here? David is not here. He's probably sleeping. Uh, David and I have been giving presentations all over the world together, and uh, it sort of became a tradition. So feel comfortable, take your own shoes as well, um, unless you know they stink, so don't. What I'm going to talk about today is a presentation that talks about essentially how the security industry is following the same footprints or footsteps of governments and uh, security agencies. Um, who's, I should be all of you, but who's been to David and Stefan's photo about the uh, spies? Some people are not raising their hands and it's really sad because it is one of the best talks this conference had. In that talk, they were telling how being a security researcher attracts the attention of certain foreign governments and security services, and they gave examples of how they were approached, or other people were approached by security agencies. And what I'll show you today is how the tactics of security agencies end up in our world, whether we are aware of it or not. So let's start. Our story begins a long, long time ago. And back then, everything was nice and simple. We didn't have internet security. There wasn't even internet. There were computers running very early uh, networks. Who remembers, let's say, um, BitNet? Just one? Oh, come on, guys. You're not that young. <laughs> so we had BitNet. And... Um, for a while, a lot of the internet was running over um, X25. Who was doing networking over X25? Who remembers the QSD chat server? Any hackers in the room? No one? That's good, because hackers, mm -hmm. I didn't say that. Okay, so, and back then, since everything was so simple and, and no, one ever, no one even knew what this whole thing was, it was very sophisticated, very few people did that. So there weren't many, many criminals, right? And uh, gradually, the things became a little bit more sophisticated, right? So when the internet began, it wasn't even called internet. It was the ARPANET. ARPA is the Advanced Research Products, uh, Projects Agency of the United States. And they started this network. The, the idea behind it was to allow um, establishments to communicate on doomsday. If something like really, really bad happened, then people needed to be able to talk to each other. And it began like this. Now, if you look closely on the right side of the photo, you will see this. Who can read this, guys on the front row? What does this say? NSA. NSA. You see, so back then, the NSA already had its grip, okay? And this is really early. This is like 1974, I think. I wasn't even born there. Um, and that's what it looked like. And it looked mostly like this. Who remembers this? Okay, come on, it can't be just one. Two, thank you. This is, of course, from War Games. Okay, this is the computer at school, and pencil was the password where he changed the grades with, right? So the internet mostly looked like this. We were all using terminals or, you know, black and white or monochrome. It was green, if you remember that. And it sounded mostly like this, although, I will need to use a microphone here. So tell me if you recognize this. Yes, so. I spent many, many nights waking up to this in the middle of the night as my computer was phoning to BBSs to get echo mail. It wasn't even email back then. This, by the way, also from War Games, was called an acoustic coupler, right? Most of us know the modems as they are today, but back then it was called an acoustic coupler, and you actually use your original phone. You put it on it, and that's how it worked. And the bad guys looked like this. Although I have to say, they're starting to look like this again. But this is from way back then. Who knows who this guy is? Kevin Mitnick, right. And 
the truth about Kevin Mitnick is that he wasn't so much a hacker as he was a reverse uh, a, a social engineer. Most of what he did was by talking to people and you know convincing them to do things. But still, he was considered the world's most dangerous hacker at the time, and he did amazing things and he got access to amazing things. Everything was simpler there, even the phone networks. There was a lot of phone networks hacking back then. It was called freaking, if you remember that. And then, one day, in 1993, this happens. The guy on the right, his name is Gil Schwed. He is one of the three founders of the company Checkpoint. These three guys met in the army. And in the army, they were doing a lot of network security, as rudimentary as it was. And they needed to find a solution to segregate the network of the army unit they were working in from outside network. So they created this solution, this product, and they called it Firewall. And then when they left the army, they said, well, pff, there's money in this, let's do it again. And they created this. Firewall 1 was the first product in 1993. And just like that, everything changed. It was the first time that there was a distinction between my network and everybody else's, my organization, my perimeter, and the rest of the world. Because before that, the only thing that was preventing the outside world from connecting to your servers was just a login and a password. If you guys remember the X25 days, you needed to know the NUA, network user address, which was sort of the equivalent of an IP address. And then there would be a login and a password. And sometimes it would be just one of those, right? But now, all of a sudden, the world changed. And when you put fences, there's always someone who takes up the challenge and says, oh, there's a fence here, so I can go over it. And this was the beginning of the change. From that moment on, everything was going to change. So let's look for a second on society. We began as you know, hunters. We were hunters gatherers running in Africa, collecting uh, herbs and nuts and killing animals. Over time, as civilization developed, we started living in small uh, fixed camps because we were wanderers. And from fixed camps, we evolved into villages. And villages, they don't have security because it's just a number of huts. But eventually, we began living in communities and in cities. And cities had uh, the wall, right? So that was the firewall of back then. And in the wall, there was this castle gate, okay? You guys probably remember from all the movies, there was this huge gate, and you had to look up, there was a guy on the wall, and you had to say who you were and why you came, and if they liked you, then they opened the gate, right? This was what we were like as little communities. But then from cities evolved countries, and then countries needed to start checking their borders to decide who comes in and who goes out and how to control it. We are going to be using four examples throughout the presentation, uh, four representations of the various security services that I'm going to talk about. The first one is the English or the United Kingdom. That's this. This is the US Immigration and Naturalization Service, the INS. In all the movies, you see the good guy or the bad guy coming to some, you know, someone working at this uh, place and they try to convince them to tell them things by telling them, I'm going to call the INS. This is the INS. This is the, the office that is in charge of making sure that no illegal uh, immigrants are in the country. This is the Russian or the Soviet. Um, throughout the presentation, I'm going to be talking about both the times of the cold age and uh, recent years, so there's not going to be a precise distinction between the USSR and Russia. So sometimes I'll be mixing that up. It's not that important, as long as you get the message. And of course, since I'm Israeli, this is the Israel um, Immigration Service. Right? So we had countries built uh, border services to control who comes in and who goes out. So network security, we did the exact same thing. We created a list of products, and all these products, some of them from back in 93, but some of them are even new, they all do the same thing. They look at the traffic coming into the organization or going outside the organization, and they run rules on it, and they check. 
The purpose is like the border control. Let's control what's coming in and what's going out. And this gave people a sense of security because all of a sudden their network was isolated and all the bad hackers that were running around the world, they were no longer relevant. But it wasn't long before people realized that it was a false sense of security. Why? For two reasons. The first one was that as defenses evolved, so did the attacks. So if you had a firewall, people would find vulnerabilities in firewalls, for example. But then there was another thing, and this is more of the last 10 years. When the hackers and the attackers realized that they can't come in through the firewall, they started looking at what the firewall lets in by default. Okay, what doors are always open? And the most common two doors that are always open are your email and your web browsing. And if you'll read all the, the malware reports, all the APT reports, all the famous attacks, you will see that they are almost all based on the fact that someone was made to browse to a malicious website or maybe someone received a malicious email. Why? Because these are two doors that are always open. Imagine uh, a big company, they have an HR department, right? And in that HR department, they have a recruiter. What does a recruiter do? They open emails with CVs every day. That's what they do. So they're going to open all the emails that they get. And they're going to open all the PDF files that they get. Why? Because it's their job. And once hacker realized that, all of a sudden it was clear that the perimeter was no longer enough. Just having a firewall was not going to do it to protect your network. And that led to a rude awakening. All of a sudden, we were like, oh, am I allowed to say holy shit here? Is it? I don't know. Okay, holy shit, it's not enough. So the, perimeter, the premises is dead, long live the perimeter, or the other way, yeah. The perimeter is dead, long live the premises. The premises is the area we're in. This is the premises, okay? So now we needed to protect that. Countries have the same problem. They want to know what's going on inside the country. And for that, they have the internal security services. The internal security services are the services that make sure that no spies are coming in the country, no one in the country is trying to fight it from the inside, to start a rebellion, to plan a coup. Right? These are the internal security services. So the British have the MI5, the Americans have the, C uh, the FBI, the Russians had a mixture of the uh, KGB and later the FSB, and this is the Israeli, it's called the Shin Bet, it's, it's in Hebrew actually, and it, mean, it means the General Security Service. And these services, that's what they do. So once again, in our world, networks did the same. All of a sudden, there was a whole line of products running inside your organization, already inside, checking what's going on. It was a lot about, uh, for example, network traffic. Is a computer in sales supposed to access a database in marketing? Is someone from HR allowed to access a server where the source code is? These were questions that were not asked before. No one ever thought about that because like I said before, the thought was, we have a fence, and if you got in the fence, then you're okay. But that was not the case anymore. So endpoint antivirus, that is the oldest thing. I used to write those when I was 17, right? Back in the uh, late 80s and early 90s. Um, traffic monitoring, uh, even DLP. DLP, data leakage prevention, is a product that is looking at the data inside your computer before you send it out. If you wrote a document and you wanted to send it to someone and it, it contains confidential information, then these products would prevent it from happening because it would be like someone on the inside trying to cause damage. But once again, it was not enough. Why? Because suddenly we realized that not all attacks actually required getting into your organization. Remember, we started with the firewall. The firewall was supposed to prevent someone from going into the network. And then the bad guys managed to copy, uh, to bypass that. So that was no longer enough. So now we were looking at the inside. But that is not enough anymore either. And I'll give you a few examples. And they almost all revolve about, around websites. First of all, of course, let's mention the attack from a few days back. 
the huge IoT induced attack on the Dyn DNS servers that took down many of the big services. No one was hacked as far as the attack, right? I'm not talking about the IoT devices, that's something else. But as far as Twitter and, and Google and whatever go, no one hacked them, no one even accessed their servers, right? But there was still something going on. There was an attack on them that prevented them from working. So as far as they were concerned, they were under attack and there was a damage. What happens if you're a big, uh, let's say a, a, an e-commerce, right? Let's say you're Amazon and you have a website and you have prices and your competition is surfing to your website and they're copying all the prices and then they're taking off one dollar or five zloty or whatever and they put it on their website. You're losing business and once again, no one hacked. What happens if someone is trying to brute force um, passwords? That happens all the time. And you know why? Because people use passwords in more than one place and every now and then some website is not securing the passwords well and they get leaked. So what do hackers do? They take all these leaked passwords and they go try them at all these other websites and sometimes they succeed. Okay? There are many, many more examples of how attacking your website does not include hacking into it and you still get damaged as far as your business goes, right? So now the premises is that it's not good enough. We have to look outside the fence, the perimeter, okay? Don't wait for someone to come to you. Be ready for them, right? So it was time to go, to boldly go, where basically every foreign security service has gone before. We talked about the internal security service, that is the service that is inside a country, but every country has a foreign intelligence service. And these services take care of the interests of the country happening in other places. Sometimes it's about espionage, sometimes it's about fighting terror. Okay, the Israeli government is constantly being attributed with various dead terrorists all around the world. That's not in Israel, okay? So they blame us. Did we do it? I don't know, they didn't tell me, they didn't ask me, but maybe. So the British have MI6, James Bond, he's MI6, okay? The Americans have the CIA. You've seen a zillion films about that. The Russians, once again, this was all mixed up. Uh, the KGB used to do both, and then it was the FSB, and there's also the GRU, and I'm not an, an expert. If any of you guys knows better, feel free to update me uh, after that. And the Israelis have the Mossad. Everyone knows Mossad, right? Just as an anecdote, the word Mossad actually means um, institution or establishment, because the long uh, the full name is the Institution for Intelligence and Special Jobs. But it's too long. We don't like long things, so we just say Mossad. And everyone else says Mossad. So it's nice. Now there's a Hebrew word that everyone knows. Now the question is, how is that relevant? Because we're talking about spy agencies, and, and we're, we're, we're IT securities, right? We're good guys, and, and we're on the defending side. And, and how can that be related? Well. It's very related. For starters, we have identical missions. Yes, we are actually tackling the same problems. And I'll explain. Mission number one that a country has to deal with or a foreign intelligence service has to deal with, discover the enemy plans, right? You wanna know what the enemy is planning before they do it so you can get ready. I don't suppose anyone knows who this guy is? Any Israelis, by the way, here at all? No? Okay, this guy is called Dr. Ashraf Marwan. He was an Egyptian, very, very close to the, the leadership. He was like friends with the prime minister and the president of Egypt, and he was a spy. He was an Israeli spy. And he actually called the Israelis and told them in 1973, in October, that there was a war going to break. Okay, he was the highest ranking spy Israel ever had in Egypt, right? So this is basic stuff, right? Foreign security services, that's what they do. Intelligence, spies. What do we do? We go on the darknet and we go on the forums of all the hackers. Why? Because hackers, they like to brag. They like to say, oh, I'm going to attack this and that, or look at this cool tool that I have. And if you can get them to trust you by posing as one of them, 
then sometimes you will hear about plans before they happen, right? So you will know, and this happens, by the way, a lot in the financial sectors. There are, uh, there's a whole group of companies that do threat intelligence. They go to all, all these forums and they wait for hackers to say, uh, we want to attack this and that bank who can help us, or we are going to attack this and that bank who is going to help us, and then they give the bank that information. So the bank knows that it's about to get attacked, right? So this is the first example. The second thing that intelligence services need to do is to uh, obtain the enemy technology. This is learning what sort of weapon the other side is going to use against you, right? So the Russians did that with the nuclear uh, bomb, right? We all know that the Americans had some spies in Project Manhattan, and that's how the Russians learned everything that they uh, learned or closed the gaps, right? So this guy, Captain Munir Redfa, he was an Iraqi pilot, and back in the 60s, he decided to defect. Now, since there is no train, train line between Iraq and Israel, the guy jumped into his MiG-21 and flew over all the way through Iraq, Jordan, and Syria to Israel. And he landed his MiG-21 in Israel. This is the same MiG, it's now in a museum. Now the amazing thing about that is that back in the 60s, the MiG-21 was the most advanced fighter jet that the Soviet bloc has produced. And of course, it was sold to all the Arab countries and Southeast Asia. And the West knew very little about the MiG-21. It was faster, faster and more maneuverable than anything else the West had. And no one knew what the heck was going on. And yes, some of them have been shot down. And of course, intelligence agencies looked at, uh, at the wreck. But it's not even close to having a fully functional plane in your hands. It was one of the first times the West has ever had the opportunity to look at a MiG-21. Okay? What do we do? We go to, once again, the darknet, and we look for criminals who like to sell their tools. Because as you all heard probably more than one time, now it's all about crime as a service. If you want to attack someone, you don't need to know how to build a botnet, you don't need to know how to write a malware, you don't need to know how to distribute it. You can buy all these services today. You pay with Bitcoin or whatever, but someone else will do that for you. So the same goes for malware, right? It's very common with exploit kits. So if I want to know what an exploit kit does and how to defend myself from it, I will go on the darknet and I will pay the money to get a hold of that exploit kit. When I used to work at Checkpoint, we did that. We rented a, an exploit kit. It cost us $3,000. We had it for exactly one month. That was the rental agreement. But we made enough, or we did enough research to be able to defend against this for the rest of the time. Okay, so we do the same thing. Next, monitor counterintelligence. So, okay, we have spies. We send them to other countries to find out what they're planning and what weapons they're using. But if we're doing it to them, then they're doing it to us. And someone needs to, uh, to take care of that, right? So you always want to know what are the spy plans of the other side. Who knows who this guy is? No, this is Aldrich Ames. Aldrich Ames was the head of counterintelligence for the CIA. Who knows who this guy is? He's more famous. This is Kim Philby. Kim Philby was the head of counterintelligence for MI5. That was their job, to find Russian spies. But guess what? Both of them were Russian spies. True story. The Russians managed to recruit the both of them so the Russians not only knew all about the English and the American spies in Russia, they also knew everything about uh, the attempts to catch their spies. Imagine how brilliant that is. And what do we do? Or not us in this particular case, but what happens in our world? And this is my favorite example. Duku 2. Who read this report? Anyone? Duku 2, which is a malware that is believed to come from the same group that created Stuxnet and Flame and Gauss. The biggest threat to that network or that group was Kaspersky. 
Because let's face it, they are very, very good. Kaspersky, they are probably the best researchers in the world. I hope I'm not you know, insulting anyone here. They do the best research. They do the best APT reports. And if you've ever been to their con conferences, they do the best presentations as well. So as far as that group that was creating the malware was concerned, Kaspersky was a huge threat. So you know what they did? They infected Kaspersky. This malware was found inside Kaspersky network. Why? Because they wanted to know, what does Kaspersky know? What are they going to do with our malware? How much of it have they discovered? How much of it have they researched? So this is planting a spy in the counterintelligence department of the other side. So we talked about missions, but it's not just the missions. <clears throat> we actually have the same challenges as well. We have the same things that make our job difficult. For example, identifying the enemy. It's not simple. A long time ago, or when the battles just started, it was very easy. There were armies. They had uniform. You looked at the guy, you saw the uniform, you knew it was on your side, it was on the other side. But if you look at Al-Qaeda and ISIS, how do you even know who the enemy is? They don't have uniform, right? A guy can just wake up one morning and decide, okay, I joined ISIS. You go on a web page, you uh, make an, an oath, you submit yourself, whatever, and now you're ISIS. But then you go to your job and you go out with friends and you look exactly the same. There's no way to know who the enemy is. And what happens in our world? Same thing, anonymous. Anonymous is not a defined entity. It's this concept, this idea. And every single morning, each and every one of you can decide that they join anonymous and fight for the cause. And each and every morning, you can decide that you're no longer an anonymous member. No one knows, there's no list. You look the same. Maybe there's a, someone who's anonymous in this room. I wouldn't know. So it's very hard to tell who the enemy is. It's not clear, so it makes it a lot harder. And the second problem is identifying the battleground. Because if we look back at countries, the battleground was very simple. There was the front. One side of the front was your side. The other side of the front was the other guy's front. What was the other guy's side? It was very simple. If you opened the map, you knew which side you were on, okay? But what happens today? This is a map that the New York Times drew of ISIS uh, attacks in 2015. Look at how dispersed it is. It is all around the world. So the battlefield, battlefield is no longer in a defined place. It's not the state of Iraq. It's not the state of Syria. Yes, there is a civil war in Syria, but that's only part of the story because ISIS is everywhere. And this is from 2015. We had some large attacks this year as well. Some of them were in the middle of France, let's say. So is Paris the battleground? You don't know. It's very hard to say. What happens in our world? In our world, many companies no longer develop their own services because you can have someone else do that. And a lot of our infrastructures are moving to the cloud. I work at a startup company. It's relatively new, it's about two years old. So when you start a company, you don't develop all the infrastructure that you need because there are companies that do that. So it turns out, okay, for example, who's using Slack? So you realize that all the chats you've ever made are stored on the servers of Slack, right? So today we have cloud services for chatting, for backing up, for storage services, for recruitment, ERP, CRM, whatever. And your data is not even in your server. It's on somebody else's server. Now, do you know how well they protect it? Do you know if they have a good IT security team? Do you know if they monitor all the recent vulnerabilities, if they do all the patches? You don't know that. So the battleground is no longer defined. It's not that these are my servers and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to protect them as best I can. And yes, sometime I will lose. But now I don't even know where my data is. Maybe it's on Amazon. Maybe they have their own uh, rented servers. You don't even know that. And then comes beyond the periphery. The problem with the periphery is that 
you are always responding. Okay? The enemy is doing something and then you fight them back. But it turns out that countries and security services or foreign intelligence services don't always wait for the other side to do something before they do it. In fact, they go out and they engage the enemy before the enemy comes to them. And you will hear a few stories now, and some of them are just appalling. They're all true. I'm not making any of this up. This is all from the internet. I can give you the references, or most of it comes from Wikipedia anyway. But these are all true stories of what countries, governments, and security services do uh, to attack the enemy before the enemy comes to them. So, first example. When the Americans were looking for bin Laden, they knew he was hiding somewhere in Pakistan. They didn't know exactly where, but through some intelligence, they had some good idea. There was a certain city, and they knew he lived at a certain part of the city, but that was not enough to find him. The Americans had an old DNA sample of bin Laden from a previous arrest. So they decided to do the following. They recruited a Pakistani doctor, and the CIA created a fake um, immunization um, operation. They went door to door, family to family, and they vaccinated Pakistani kids against, I don't remember, maybe hepatitis, maybe something else. Jaundice, I don't know, right? Every time that a syringe was used to uh, give the vaccination, it was sent back for DNA analysis. And guess what? A few months into the operation, one of the syringes contained the DNA of a little kid whose DNA matched that of Bin Laden. They found Bin Laden by vaccinating his kid. And that's how they could send the SEAL team to snatch Bin Laden, or they didn't end up snatching him, they ended up shot, uh, shooting him, but that's how they found him, by faking a vaccination operation um, in Pakistan. And this is a true story. And you know what's the worst part about this? Let's say that you did a vaccination, which is a good thing, and on the way you caught the terrorist. But the vaccination step was just first of three. If you travel, then you know you need to get vaccinations, and, and certain vaccinations need a booster shot, and they didn't even bother. So many kids just got the first shot and didn't end up being vaccinated because they didn't get the booster shots. So countries can do some very vicious things. This guy, this guy is called Jeffrey Sterling. He was a CIA agent, and he broke the story about the CIA trying to sell defective nuclear-related equipment to the Iranians. And um, we don't know exactly why he was doing that. There were two uh, suspected uh, reasons. One was to frame the Iranis, Iranians, to say, ah, you see, they're, they're buying stuff. The other one was like, okay, if they're already buying stuff, let's make sure it's defective. We don't know for sure. But this shows you how countries and intelligence services think. Let's sell them stuff and stick it to them while doing that, okay? Every now and then, there is a Iranian nuclear scientist that ends up exploding somewhere in the middle of Tehran. And of course, they all blame us. So this is allegedly by Israel. And the rationalization, let's assume that it is Israel because it serves my presentation, um, that, uh, of course, if the Iranians are trying to develop a nuclear bomb because they want to destroy Israel, then we're not going to wait for them. We're just going to sabotage the effort, okay? So, you know, you can understand why someone would do such a thing. But it's not just the Israelis. Who knows who this guy is? Okay, so, yeah. There are more people who know who this guy is than... All the other examples, I wonder what that means. This is Alexander Litvinenko, and he was one of the most vocal uh, opponents to the Kremlin. And the Kremlin decided that that person was causing them too much trouble, so he ended up getting a little gift in his tea, 
in London, I think it was, he was poisoned by a radioactive polonium. I think it was polonium-216, I'm not sure. And once you get that, that's it, you're dead. It takes a little bit of time. Um, if I remember correctly, and I'm not entirely sure, so if I'm making a mistake, please forgive me, this element um, emits an alpha radiation, which does not penetrate the skin, so if I held a lump of polonium here and showed everyone, it, nothing would happen. But when you in ingest it, when it's inside your body, then now it's hitting you from the inside, and there was nothing that could be done. So this guy uh, eventually ended up dying. And there was actually a huge report, which I never read, like 350-page report by the British that pointed the finger at the Russians, saying there was no doubt it was the Russians. They had the whole story figured out. And think of how terrible that is. I mean, it's one thing if you are um, a scientist that develops weapons. I'm not saying you can kill whomever you don't like, but okay, let's say that the guy was creating weapons. This guy was just talking, right? He was opposing the government. He wasn't killing anyone. He wasn't developing weapons. But someone didn't like the fact that he was doing what he was doing, and he is dead. Um, yeah, so the question is, what can we do? We as a, as a security industry, because we are being attacked from all directions, all directions. We're being attacked on our infrastructures. We're being attacked on the IoT. We're being attacked by email, by web servers. Criminals are stealing our money our hard-earned money, our pension money, what can we do in order to fight back? And the answer is, we need to do the same. But there's one problem. It needs to be legal. We are bound to the laws because we are the good guys and we play by the rules. So we can't just do whatever we want. And this means that we need to help ourselves by lobbying and making some of the actions legal to us. Because for example, in most countries, if you find a CNC server of a botnet, you're not allowed to hack to it. And if for any reason, because many times the CNC server is on a hacked computer. Someone found a vulnerable server, they hacked into that, they put the CNC server there. So while you think you're attacking the criminals, you're actually attacking somebody else's server, and they don't even know. So there's, there are a lot of legal problems, and this is one of the things. And another thing that we need to, uh, sorry, another thing that we need to remember um, is we need to work together because it turns out that the criminals collaborate. They work with each other, they share data, they share information. So we need to do the same. And if anything, because when you don't work together and you don't collaborate, then accidents happen and things get uh, dirty. Thank you. Thank you. That's it.